when we think about setup, a lot of this talk is going to be, um, we're going to kind of flip our minds a little bit. And um, a lot of times I think that we listen a lot to the violin and the chin rest and the shoulder rest in terms of what we decide is our setup, right? So what we're going to do now is kind of flip things on its, on its side and, or, you know, over, and we're going to, I'm going to kind of go through how the reason this came about for myself. It's, it's really, I wanted this for myself, and that's why I made it. So I believe that really in order to, um, in other words, it's not enough to just have something. We also have to understand what to do with it and why we want it, right? Um, so I could come up here and just say, hey, who wants to try it? But I don't think that I would be doing you much good. I think that we actually need to kind of talk about um, some principles and, and things like that about, about how to think about this because it is so new. So first thing, I would say that imagine for a moment that we're in space and we're floating along and wherever we put something, it stays. So if we were to put the violin somewhere on us, if you can imagine for a moment, do you know where exactly you would want it? Do you know exactly where you would want it? If you could have, your, if you could have it to where there's no tension in your body, it just is where you want it. And I, I, I guess like for myself, I didn't really know that when I first got to Eastman. So I had, I had a pretty good sense of what my body should look like, right? But then my teacher started saying, hey, you know, you need to have these motions in your playing. But she's like this tall, much shorter arms. And so if I put the violin the same way on my body as she does on hers, it's going to be have different angles in my body. So the motions aren't going to be the same because the angles aren't the same, right? So it took me about three years and of her sort of harping on me, you know, it's this, this, this. And then I kind of realized, oh, I actually need to move the instrument, not myself. So then I was like, okay, let's try and move the instrument. And then I quickly realized that I couldn't find the tool I wanted that would actually help me put it where I wanted it. And there's for a number, this is for a number of reasons, and we'll kind of look at these. So um, we have to have this concept of what we want in our minds before we can really effectively find our setup and find the tools that will help us get there, right? Otherwise, we're kind of just grasping, right? And we're listening to that probably too much. So we're going to, I'm going to, this first little bit, we're going to kind of, I'm going to go through what my teacher told me and other things that really resonated with me in terms of, um, motions in playing and then body posture, all that sort of thing. So that we're sort of for the second half, which is when you can come up and I'll invite some volunteers up to try it. Maybe we'll be sort of more on the same page in terms of what we want to, um, to do, right? So, all right. So, the, and then some more <laughs> uh, setup stuff. Um, I think that the other thing that we need to realize is that setup is a lifelong process. And it's also, it's, it's violin playing is really um, about self-exploration. So what works for me might not work for you. And that's perfectly fine. In fact, a lot of what I say today you might disagree with. And that's fine. There's a lots of different ways to, to put this into language. There's many different ways to think about what we're going to talk about. This is just the way that resonated with me well because it's quite mechanical in a sense. And, and, and it was clear in my mind what my teacher wanted me to do. So I'm just going to share with you basically those basic things. All right, so I think the logical place to start would be body position. And there's lots of writing on this, so I'm just going to touch on this briefly and tell you the things that, that I thought were quite helpful in my own playing. Um, the first thing is the neck tall and well stacked. And one of the ways I've, I've um, you know, just saying that doesn't really do a whole lot for us. We actually have to have something to do or think, right? So I think of it as if there's a, there's a flat spot on the top of your head. I think of that as in the center of that you put a little string and then attach a balloon to it and the balloon pulls your neck up. So you're not, you know, going like this from below, right? It's actually lengthening the back of the neck a little bit, right? Okay, now the other thing, and this is kind of a, you don't really realize it maybe that it's a misconception until I tell you this, but the place that we nod is is we a lot of times think of the neck ending somewhere around here. It actually ends between the ears. So the nod happens between the ears. It's actually, I think, higher than a lot of, that I have realized. So there's actually a violinist in um, Europe uh, named Chrisman Taylor, and she's the one who kind of coined the term the royal nod. 
right? So mm -hmm. this. So that's that's where it's, it's encouraged. I think I've I've read it before that we're encouraged to sort of turn the head and not, and that's what we want to do because we want to keep the back of the neck nice and long, but we also need to be able to um, you know put our chin down. So um, that was something that helped me. Um, and one thing that she's noticed or found, or I don't know if maybe she didn't, but um, is that when you have your head nicely stacked on your neck, it actually there's a release in the arms. So if I were to bring somebody up here and hold their hand, and then they knock their head off the top of their spine, a lot of times you'll feel more weight in their arm, which you know we want, we want efficiency in violin playing. So it's good to have your, your head stacked on top of your neck. Um, one phrase you'll hear a lot of is shoulders back and down. Basically because a lot of us live here, and technically, anatomically speaking, we should probably be more here. Um, shoulders back and down is good if you're here. If you're already here, then it doesn't do anything for you. So shoulders back and down is one of those phrases that I would say has relative terms into, in it. So back from where, down from where. So it's useful, but I think that we can have some more concrete terms. So one thing that's helped me a lot is if I hang my arm, you want your thumb pointing forwards. And a lot of us, if I, if I just naturally stand, see how my arms kind of roll forward? So that actually should probably be here. And I worked with a ballet dancer one time, uh, worked with, I was a teacher with him in the same school, and he walked around like this. And the kids, I mean, there's, there's a sort of command about this posture, right? And the kids just, you know, they could feel it. And he was just so used to standing like this. Obviously, he worked on it, right? But we live our lives in front of us on the computer and everything. So um, a lot of times, the muscles here will sort of sort of shorten over time. So we can spend some time um, stretching these, these out so that it's actually, we can sort of eventually, hopefully, move our shoulders back a little bit. So that's kind of a basic thing that I think actually gives everybody a concrete thing to think about, not just shoulders back and down, but that you want your thumb pointing forwards. And you can do that in the grocery store, walking down the street, all that sort of thing.